Lee Chervain dared to learn the mind-shattering truth of that incredible barrier. The Wall of Darkness by Arthur C. Clarke. That's next on the Lost Sci-Fi Podcast with at least one lost vintage sci-fi short story in every episode. Last week was a record for us. More podcast listeners and more YouTube listeners than ever before. We also receive more emails, comments, ratings, and reviews. Thanks for your support. Keith Stump 1712 commented on a YouTube video. These stories are greatly welcome here in the high Andes of Peru during our long winter nights. Thanks, Keith. Stephen sent us an email. Greetings from Vancouver Island on the west coast of Canada. It's been a delight to discover your podcast and storytelling. These stories have been keeping me company on my commute to work. Keep up the wonderful work bringing these old stories back to life and inspiring our imaginations. Thank you, Stephen. We love your comments on our YouTube channel and the emails you send us on LostSciFi.com or Scott at LostSciFi.com. We take requests, and many of you have requested that we go live on YouTube. So, next Thursday, July 20th, at 4 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, we'll be live on YouTube. We'll do some narrating, answer any questions you have, and for the most part, leave it up to you. If you want to send us questions in advance, please do so. Scott at LostSciFi.com. That way you can get your question answered even if you can't be with us live. That's next Thursday, July 20th at 4 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. One in Los Angeles and Vancouver, 3 p.m. in the Andes Mountains in Peru, and 9 p.m. in London. It should be fun. I hope you can join us. Arthur C. Clarke has been on the podcast before with A Walk in the Dark. Today's story can be found on page 66 of Super Science Stories. In July 1949, 74 years ago, The Wall of Darkness by Arthur C. Clarke. Many and strange are the universes that drift like bubbles in the foam upon the river of time. Some, a very few, move against or athwart its current, and fewer still are those that lie forever beyond its reach, knowing nothing of the future or the past. Shervain's tiny cosmos was not one of these. Its strangeness was of a different order. It held one world only the planet of Shervain's race, and a single star, the great sun Trilorn, that brought it life and light. Shervain knew nothing of night, for Trilorn was always high above the horizon, dipping near it only in the long months of winter. Beyond the borders of the Shadowland, it was true, there came a season when Trilorn disappeared below the edge of the world and a darkness fell in which nothing could live. But even then the darkness was not absolute, though there were no stars to relieve it. Alone in its little cosmos, turning the same face always towards its solitary sun, Shervain's world was the last and the strangest jest of the maker of stars. Yet, as he looked across his father's lands, The thoughts that filled Shervain's mind were those which any human child might have known. He felt awe and curiosity and a little fear, and above all, a longing to go out into the great world before him. These things he was still too young to do, but the ancient house was on the highest ground for many miles, and he could look far out over the land that would one day be his. When he turned to the north, with Trilorn shining full upon his face, he could see many miles away the long line of mountains that curved around to the east, rising higher and higher, until they disappeared behind him in the direction of the Shadowland. 
On his left was the ocean, only a few miles away, and sometimes Shervain could hear the thunder of the waves as they fought and tumbled on the gently sloping sands. No one knew how far the ocean reached. Ships had set out across it, sailing northwards while Trilorn rose higher and higher in the sky, and the heat of its rays grew ever more intense. Long before the great sun had reached the zenith, they had been forced to return. If the mythical firelands did indeed exist, no man could ever hope to reach their burning shores. All the inhabited countries of Shervain's world lay in the narrow belt between burning heat and insufferable cold. In every land, the far north was an unapproachable region, smitten by the fury of Trilorn. And to the south of all countries lay the vast and gloomy Shadowland, where Trilorn was never more than a pale disk on the horizon, and often was not visible at all. These things Shervain learned in the years of his childhood. And in those years, he had no wish to leave the wide lands between the mountains and the sea. Since the dawn of time, his ancestors and the races before them had toiled to make these lands the fairest in the world. There were gardens bright with strange flowers. There were streams that trickled gently between moss-grown rocks to be lost in the pure waters of the tideless sea. There were fields of grain that rustled continually in the wind, as if the generations of seeds yet unborn were talking one to the other. In the great meadows and among the trees, the friendly cattle wandered aimlessly with foolish cries. And there was the great house, with its enormous rooms and its endless corridors, vast enough in reality, but huger still to the mind of a child. This was the world in which Shervain had passed his years, the world he knew and loved. As yet, what lay beyond its borders had not concerned his mind. But Shervain's universe was not one of those free from the domination of time. The harvest ripened and was gathered into the granaries. Trilorn rocked slowly through its little arc of sky and with the passing season Shervain's mind and body grew. His land seemed smaller now. The mountains were nearer, and the sea was only a brief walk from the great house. He began to learn of the world in which he lived, and to be made ready for the part he must play in its shaping. Some of these things he learned from his father, Sherval, but most he was taught by Grail, who had come across the mountains in the days of his father's father, and had now been tutor to three generations of Shervain's family. He was fond of Grail, though the old man taught him many things he had no wish to learn, and the years of his boyhood passed pleasantly enough until the time came for him to go through the mountains into the lands beyond. Ages ago, his family had come from the great countries of the East, and in every generation since, the eldest son had made that pilgrimage again to spend a year of his youth among his cousins. It was a wise custom, for beyond the mountains, much of the knowledge of the past still lingered, and there one could meet men from other lands and study their ways. In the last spring before his son's departure, Cherval collected three of his servants and certain animals it is convenient to call horses and took Chervain to see those parts of the land he had never visited before. They rode west to the sea and followed the coast for many days until Trilorn was noticeably nearer the horizon. Still, they went south, their shadows lengthening before them, turning again to the east only when the rays of the sun seemed to have lost all their power. They were now well within the limits of the Shadowland. Shervain was riding beside his father, watching the changing landscape with eager curiosity. His father was talking about the soil, describing the crops that could be grown here, and those which must fail if the attempt were made. 
But Shervain's attention was elsewhere. He was staring out across the desolate Shadowland, wondering how far it stretched and what mysteries it held. Father, he said presently, if you went south in a straight line, right across the Shadowland, would you reach the other side of the world? His father smiled. Men have asked that question for centuries, he said, but there are two reasons why they will never know the answer. What are they? The first, of course, is the darkness and the cold. Even here, nothing can live during the winter months. But there is a better reason, though I see that Grail has not spoken of it. I don't think he has, at least I do not remember. For a moment, Cherval did not reply. He stood up in his stirrups and surveyed the land of the south. Once I knew this place well, he said to Chervain. Come, I have something to show you. They turned away from the path they had been following and for several hours rode once more with their backs to the sun. The land was rising slowly now, and Chervain saw that they were climbing a great ridge of rock that pointed like a dagger into the heart of the Shadowland. They came presently to a hill too steep for the horses to ascend, and here they dismounted and left the animals in the servant's charge. There is a way around, said Cherval but it is quicker for us to climb than to take the horses to the other side. The hill, though steep, was only a small one, and they reached its summit in a few minutes. At first, Chervain could see nothing he had not seen before. There was only the same undulating wilderness that seemed to become darker and more forbidding with every yard of distance from Trilorn. He turned to his father with some bewilderment, but Cherval pointed to the far south and drew a careful line along the horizon. It is not easy to see, he said quietly. My father showed it to me from this same spot many years before you were born. Chervain stared into the dusk. The southern sky was so dark as to be almost black, and it came down to meet the edge of the world. But not quite. For along the horizon, in a great curve dividing land from sky, yet seeming to belong to neither, was a band of deeper darkness, black as the utter night which Chervain had never known. He looked at it steadfastly for a long time, and perhaps some hint of the future crept into his soul, for the darkling land seemed suddenly alive and waiting. When at last he tore his eyes away, he knew that nothing would ever be the same again, though he was still too young to recognize the challenge for what it was. And so, for the first time in his life, Chervain saw the wall. In the early spring he said farewell to his people and went with one servant over the mountains into the great lands of the eastern world. Here he met the men who shared his ancestry, and here he studied the history of his race, the arts that had grown from ancient times, and the sciences that ruled the lives of men. In the places of learning he made friends with boys who had come from lands even further to the east. Few of these he was likely to see again, but one was to play a greater part in his life than either could have imagined. Braildon's father was a famous architect, but his son intended to eclipse him. He was traveling from land to land, always learning, watching, asking questions. Though he was only a few years older than Chervain, his knowledge of the world was infinitely greater, or so it seemed to the younger boy. Between them, they took the world to pieces and rebuilt it according to their desires. Brailden dreamed of cities whose great avenues and stately towers would shame even the wonders of the past. Chervain's interests lay more with the people who would dwell in those cities and the way they ordered their lives. They often spoke of the wall, which Brailden knew from the stories of his own people, though he himself had never seen it. 
Far to the south of every country, it lay like a great barrier athwart the Shadowland. In high summer it could be reached, though with difficulty, but nowhere was there any way of passing it, and none knew what lay beyond. A hundred times the height of a man, it encircled the entire world, never pausing even when it reached the wintry sea that washed the shores of the Shadowland. Travelers had stood upon those lonely beaches, scarcely warmed by the last thin rays of Trilorn, and had seen how the shadowy wall marched out to sea, contemptuous of the waves beneath its feet. And on the far shores, other travelers had watched it come striding in across the ocean to sweep past them on its journey round the world. One of my uncles, said Brailden, once reached the wall when he was a young man. He did it for a wager, and he rode for ten days before he came beneath it. I think it frightened him. It was so huge and cold. He could not tell whether it was made of metal or of stone. And when he shouted, there was no echo at all. But his voice died away quickly, as if the wall swallowed the sound. My people believe it is the end of the world, and there is nothing beyond. If that were true, Chervain replied with irrefutable logic, the ocean would have poured over the edge before the wall was built. Not if Chiron built it when he made the world as the legends have it. Chervain did not agree. My people believe it is the work of man, perhaps the engineers of the first dynasty, who made so many wonderful things. If they really had ships that could reach the Firelands, and even ships that could fly, they might have possessed enough wisdom to build the wall. Brailden shrugged. We can never know the answer, so why worry about it? This eminently practical advice, as Chervain had discovered, was all that ordinary men ever gave him. Only philosophers were interested in unanswerable questions. To most people, the enigma of the wall, like the problem of existence itself, was a thing of no practical importance. And all the philosophers he had met had given him different answers. First, there had been Grail, whom he had questioned on his return from the Shadowland. The old man had looked at him quietly and said, there is only one thing behind the wall, so I have heard, and that is madness. Then there had been Artex, who was so old that he could scarcely hear Chervain's nervous questioning. He had gazed at the boy through eyes that seemed too tired to open fully, and had replied after a long time, Chiron built the wall in the third day of the making of the world. What is beyond we shall discover when we die, for there go the souls of all the dead. Yet Ergan, who lived in the same city, had flatly contradicted this. Only memory can answer your question, my son. For behind the wall is the land in which we lived before our births. Whom could he believe? The truth was that no one knew. If the knowledge had ever existed, it had been lost ages since. Though this quest was unsuccessful, Chervain had learned many things in his year of study. With the returning spring, he said farewell to Brailden and his other friends and set out along the ancient road that led back to his own country. Once again he made the perilous journey through the great mountain pass, where walls of ice hung threatening against the sky. He came to the place where the road curved down once more towards the world of men, where there was warmth and running water, and the breath no longer labored in the freezing air. Here, on the last rise of the road before it descended into the valley, one could see far out across the land to the distant gleam of the ocean. And there, almost lost in the mists at the edge of the world, 
Chervain could see the line of shadow that was his own country. He went on down the great ribbon of stone until he came to the bridge that men had built across the cataract in the ancient days. But the bridge was gone. The storms and avalanches of early spring had swept away one of the mighty piers and the beautiful metal rainbow lay a twisted ruin in the spray and foam a thousand feet below. The summer would have come and gone before the road could be opened once more. He paused on the last curve of the road, looking back towards the unattainable land that held all the things he loved. But the mists had closed over it, and he saw it no more. Resolutely, he turned back along the road until the open lands had vanished and the mountains enfolded him again. Brailden was still in the city when Chervain returned. He was surprised and pleased to see his friend, and together they discussed what should be done in the year ahead. Chervain's cousins, who had grown fond of their guest, were glad to see him again, but their kindly suggestion that he should devote another year to study was not well received. Chervain's plan had matured slowly in the face of considerable opposition. Even Brailden was not enthusiastic at first, and much argument was needed before he would cooperate. But after that, the agreement of everyone else who mattered was only a question of time. Summer was approaching when the two boys set out towards Brailden's country. They rode swiftly for the journey was a long one and must be completed before Trilorn began its winter fall. When they reached the lands that Brailden knew, they made certain inquiries which caused much shaking of heads. But the answers they obtained were accurate, and soon they were deep in the Shadowland, and for the second time in his life, Chervain saw the wall. It seemed not far away when they first came upon it, rising from a bleak and lonely plain. Yet they rode endlessly across that plain before the wall grew perceptibly nearer. And then they had almost reached its base before they realized how close they were. For there was no way of judging its distance until one could reach out and touch it. When Chervain gazed up at the monstrous ebony plain that had so troubled his mind, it seemed to be overhanging, about to crush him beneath its falling weight. With difficulty, he tore his eyes away from the hypnotic sight and went nearer to examine the material of which the wall was built. It was true, as Brailden had told him, that it felt cold to the touch, colder than it had any right to be, even in this sun-starved land. It felt neither hard nor soft, for its texture eluded the hand in a way that was difficult to analyze. Chervain had the impression that something was preventing him from actual contact with the surface, yet he could see no space between the wall and his fingers when he forced them against it. Strangest of all was the uncanny silence of which Brailden's uncle had spoken. Every word was deadened, and all sounds died away with unnatural swiftness. Brailden had unloaded some tools and instruments from the pack horses, and had begun to examine the wall's surface. He found very quickly that no drills or cutters would mark it in any way, and presently he came to the conclusion Chervain had already reached. The wall was not merely adamant. It was unapproachable. At last, in disgust, he took a perfectly straight metal rule and pressed its edge against the wall. While Chervain held a mirror to reflect the feeble light of Trilorn along the line of contact, Brailden peered at the rule from the other side. It was, as he had thought, an infinitely narrow streak of light showed unbroken between the two surfaces. Brailden looked thoughtfully at his friend. Chervain, he said, I don't believe the wall is made of matter as we know it 
then perhaps the legends are right. Those that say it was never built at all, but created as we see it now. I think so too, said Brailden. The engineers of the first dynasty had such powers. There are some very ancient buildings in my land that seem to have been made in a single operation from a substance that shows absolutely no sign of weathering. If it were black instead of colored, it would be very much like the material of the wall. He put away his useless tools and began to set up a simple portable theodolite. If I can do nothing else, he said with a wry smile, at least I can find exactly how high it is. When they looked back for their last view of the wall, Chervain wondered if he would ever see it again. There was nothing more he could learn. For the future, he must forget this foolish dream that he might one day master its secret. Perhaps there was no secret at all. Perhaps beyond the wall, the Shadowland stretched round the curve of the world until it met that same barrier again. That surely seemed the likeliest thing. But if it were so, then why had the wall been built? And by what race? With an almost angry effort of will, he put these thoughts aside and rode forward into the light of Trilorn, thinking of a future in which the wall would play no more part than it did in the lives of other men. So two years had passed before Chervain could return to his home. In two years, especially when one is young, much can be forgotten, and even the things nearest the heart lose their distinctness so that they can no longer be clearly recalled. When Chervain came through the last foothills of the mountains, and was again in the country of his childhood. The joy of his homecoming was mingled with a strange sadness. The news of his return had gone before him, and soon he saw far ahead a line of horses galloping along the road. He pressed forward eagerly, wondering if Cherval would be there to greet him, and was a little disappointed when he saw that Grail was leading the procession. Chervain halted as the old man rode up to his horse. Then Grail put his hand upon his shoulder. But for a while he turned away his head and could not speak. And presently Chervain learned that the storms of the year before had destroyed more than the ancient bridge. For lightning had brought his own home in ruins to the ground. Years before the appointed time, all the lands that Cherval had owned had passed into the possession of his son. Far more indeed than these, for the whole family had been assembled, according to its yearly custom, in the great house when the fire had come down upon it. In a single moment of time, everything between the mountains and the sea had passed into his keeping. He was the richest man his land had known for generations. And all these things he would have given to look again into the calm gray eyes of the father he would see no more. Trilorn had risen and fallen in the sky many times since Chervain had taken leave of his childhood on the road before the mountains. The land had flourished in the passing years, and the possessions so suddenly become his had steadily increased their value. He had husbanded them well, and now he had time once more in which to dream. More than that, he had the wealth to make his dreams come true. Often, stories had come across the mountains of the work Brailden was doing in the East, and although the two friends had never met since their youth, they had exchanged messages regularly. Brailden had achieved his ambitions. Not only had he designed the two largest buildings erected since the ancient days, but a whole new city had been planned by him, though it would not be completed in his lifetime. Hearing of these things, Chervain remembered the aspirations of his own youth, and his mind went back across the years. 
to the day when they had stood together beneath the majesty of the wall. For a long time he wrestled with his thoughts, fearing to revive old longings that might not be assuaged again. At last he made his decision and wrote to Brailden, for what was the value of wealth and power unless they could be used to shape one's dreams? Then Shervain waited, wondering if Brailden had forgotten the past and the years that had brought him fame. He had not long to wait. Brailden could not come at once, for he had great works to carry to their completion. But when they were finished, he would join his old friend. Early the next summer he came, and Shervain met him on the road below the bridge. They had been boys when they last parted, and now they were nearing middle age. Yet, as they greeted one another, the years seemed to fall away. Each was secretly glad to see how lightly time had touched the friend he remembered. They spent many days in conference together, considering the plans that Brailden had drawn up. The work was an immense one, and would take many years to complete, but it was possible to a man of Chervain's wealth. Before he gave his final assent, he took his friend to see Grail. The old man had been living for some years in the little house that Chervain had built him. For a long time he had played no active part in the life of the great estates, but his advice was always forthcoming when it was needed and it was invariably wise. Grail knew why Brailden had come to this land, and he expressed no surprise when the architect unrolled his sketches. The largest drawing showed the elevation of the wall, with a great stairway rising along its side from the plain beneath. At six equally spaced intervals, the slowly ascending ramp leveled out into wide platforms, the last of which was only a short distance below the summit of the wall. Springing from the stairway at a score of places along its length were flying buttresses, which to Grail's eye seemed very frail and slender for the work they had to do. Then he realized that the great ramp would be largely self-supporting, and on one side all the lateral thrust would be taken by the wall itself. He looked at the drawing in silence for a while, and then remarked quietly, You always manage to have your way, Shervain. I might have guessed that this would happen in the end. Then you think it a good idea? Shervain asked. He had never acted against the old man's advice, and was anxious to have it now. As usual, Grail came straight to the point. How much will it cost? Brailden told him, and for a moment there was a shocked silence. That includes, the architect said hastily, the building of a good road across the Shadowland and the construction of a small town for the workmen. The stairway itself is made from about a million identical blocks, which can be dovetailed together to form a rigid structure. We shall make these, I hope, from the minerals we find in the Shadowland. He sighed a little. I should have liked to have built it from metal rods jointed together, but that would have cost even more, for all the material would have to be brought over the mountains. Grail examined the drawing more closely. Why have you stopped short of the top? he asked. Brailden looked at Chervain who answered the question with a trace of embarrassment. I want to be the only one to make the final ascent, he replied. The last stage will be by a lifting machine on the highest platform. There may be danger. That is why I am going alone. That was not the only reason, but it was a good one. Behind the wall, so Grail had once said, lay madness. If that were true... No one else need face it. Grail was speaking once more in his quiet, dreamy voice. In that case, he said, what you do is neither good nor bad, for it concerns you alone. If the wall was built to keep something from our world, 
it will still be impassable from the other side. Brailden nodded. We had thought of that, he said with a touch of pride. If the need should come, the ramp can be destroyed in a moment by explosives at selected spots. That is good, the old man replied. When the work is finished, I hope I shall still be here. Before the winter came, the road to the wall had been marked out and the foundations of the temporary town laid. Most of the materials Brailden needed were not hard to find, for the Shadowland was rich in minerals. He had also surveyed the wall itself and chosen the spot for the stairway. When Trilorn began to dip below the horizon, Brailden was well content with the work that had been done. By the next summer, the first of the myriad concrete blocks had been made and tested to Brailden's satisfaction. And before winter came again, some thousands had been produced and part of the foundations laid. Leaving a trusted assistant in charge of the production, Brailden could now return to his interrupted work. When enough of the blocks had been made, he would be back to supervise the building but until then his guidance would not be needed. Two or three times in the course of every year, Chervain rode out to the wall to watch the stockpiles growing into great pyramids, and four years later, Brailden returned with him. Layer by layer, the lines of stone started to creep up the flanks of the wall, and the slim buttress began to arch out into space. For a third of every year, the work had to be abandoned, and there were anxious months in the long winter when Chervain stood on the borders of the Shadowland, listening to the storms that thundered past him into the reverberating darkness. But Brailden had built well, and every spring the work was standing unharmed. The last stones were laid seven years after the beginning of the work. Standing a mile away so that he could see the structure in its entirety, Chervain remembered with wonder how all this had sprung from the few sketches Brailden had shown him years ago. And he knew something of the emotion the artist feels when his dreams become reality. And he remembered, too, the day when, as a boy by his father's side, he had first seen the wall far off against the dusky sky of the Shadowland. There were guardrails around the upper platform. Chervain did not care to go near its edge. The ground was at a dizzying distance, and he tried to forget his height by helping Brailden and the workmen erect the simple hoist that would lift him the remaining twenty feet. When it was ready, he stepped into the machine and turned to his friend with all the assurance he could muster. I shall be gone only a few minutes, he said with elaborate casualness. Whatever I find, I'll return immediately. He could hardly have guessed how small a choice was his. Grail was now almost blind and would not know another spring. But he recognized the approaching footsteps and greeted Brailden by name before his visitor had time to speak. I am glad you came, he said. I've been thinking of everything you told me, and I believe I know the truth at last. Perhaps you have guessed it already. No, said Brailden. I have been afraid to think of it. The old man smiled a little. Why should one be afraid of something merely because it is strange? The wall is wonderful, yes, but there's nothing terrible about it to those who will face its secret without flinching. When I was a boy, Brailden, my old master once said that time could never destroy the truth. It could only hide it among legends. He was right. From all the fables that have gathered around the wall, I can now select the ones that are part of history. Long ago, Brailden, 
when the first dynasty was at its height, Trilorn was hotter than it is now, and the Shadowland was fertile and inhabited, as perhaps one day the Firelands will be when Trilorn is old and feeble. Men could go southwards as they pleased, for there was no wall to bar the way. Many must have done so, looking for new lands in which to settle. What happened to Shervain befell them also, and it must have wrecked many minds, so many that the scientists of the first dynasty built the wall to prevent madness from spreading through the land. I cannot believe that this is true, but the legend says that it was made in a single day, with no labor, out of a cloud that encircled the world. He fell into a reverie, and for a moment Brailden did not disturb him. His mind was far in the past, picturing his world as a perfect globe floating in space, while the ancient ones threw that band of darkness around the equator. False, though that picture was, in its most important detail, he could never wholly erase it from his mind. As the last few feet of the wall moved slowly past his eyes, Shervain needed all his courage to prevent him from crying out to be lowered again. He remembered certain terrible stories he had once dismissed with laughter. But what if, after all, those stories had been true, and the wall had been built to keep some horror from the world. He tried to forget these thoughts, and found it not hard to do so once he had passed the topmost level of the wall. At first, he could not interrupt the picture his eyes brought him. Then he saw that he was looking across an unbroken black sheet, whose width he could not judge. The little platform came to a stop, and he noted with half-conscious admiration how accurate Brailden's calculations had been. Then, with the last word of assurance to the group below, he stepped onto the wall and began to walk steadily forwards. At first, it seemed as if the plane before him was infinite, for he could not even tell where it met the sky. But he walked on, unfaltering, keeping his back upon Trilorn. There was something wrong. It was growing darker with every step he took. Startled, he turned around and saw that the disk of Trilorn had now become pale and dusky, as if seen through a darkened glass. With mounting fear, he realized that this was by no means all that had happened. Trilorn was smaller than the sun he had known all his life. He shook his head in an angry gesture of defiance. These things were fancies. He was imagining them. Indeed, they were so contrary to all experience that somehow he no longer felt frightened but strode resolutely forward with only a glance at the sun behind. When Trilorn had dwindled to a point and the darkness was all around him, it was time to abandon pretense. A wiser man would have turned back there and then, and Shervain had a sudden nightmare vision of himself, lost in this eternal twilight between earth and sky unable to retrace the path that led to safety. Then he told himself that as long as he could see Trilorn at all, he could be in no real danger. He went on, with many backward glances at the faint guiding light behind him. Trilorn itself had vanished, but there was still a dim glow in the sky to mark its place. And presently, he needed its aid no longer, for far ahead a second light was appearing in the heavens. At first it seemed only the faintest of glimmers. When he was sure of its existence, 
he noticed that Trilorn had already disappeared. But he felt more confidence now, and as he moved onwards, the returning light helped to subdue his fears. When he saw that he was indeed approaching another sun, when he could tell beyond any doubt that it was expanding, as a moment ago he had seen Trilorn contract, he forced all amazement down into the depths of his mind. Now at last he could see, faintly through the darkness, the ebon line that marked the wall's other rim. Soon he would be the first man, in thousands of years, perhaps in eternity, to look upon the lands that it had sundered from his world. Would they be as fair as his own? And would there be people there whom he would be glad to greet? But that they would be waiting, and in such a way, was more than he had dreamed. Grail stretched his hand out to the cabinet beside him and fumbled for a large sheet of paper that was lying upon it. Brailden watched him in silence, and the old man continued. How often we have all heard arguments about the size of the universe and whether it has any boundaries. We can imagine no ending to space, yet our minds rebel at the idea of infinity. Some philosophers have imagined that space is limited by curvature in a higher dimension. I expect you know the theory. It may be true of other universes, if they exist, but for ours the answer is more subtle. Along the line of the wall, Brailden, our universe comes to an end, and yet does not. There was no boundary, nothing to stop one from going onwards before the wall was built. The wall itself is merely a man-made barrier, sharing the properties of the space in which it lies. He held the sheet of paper towards Brailden and slowly rotated it. Here, he said, is a plain sheet. It has, of course, two sides. Can you imagine one that has not? Brailden stared at him in amazement. That's impossible. Ridiculous. But is it? said Grail softly. He reached towards the cabinet again, and his fingers groped in its recesses. Then he drew out a long, flexible strip of paper. We cannot match the intellects of the first dynasty, but what their minds could grasp directly we can approach by analogy. He ran his fingers along the paper strip, then joined the two ends together to make a circular loop. Here I have a shape which is perfectly familiar to you, the section of a cylinder. I run my finger round the inside so, and now along the outside, the two surfaces are quite distinct. You can go from one to the other only by moving across the thickness of the strip. Do you agree? Of course said Brailden, still puzzled. But what does it prove? Nothing, said Grail. But now watch. This son, Shervain thought, was Trilorn's identical twin. The darkness had now lifted completely, and there was no longer the sensation, which he would not try to understand, of walking across an infinite plane. He was moving slowly now, for he had no desire to come too suddenly upon that vertiginous precipice. In a little while, he could see a distant horizon of low hills, as bare and lifeless as those he had left behind him. So he walked on, and when presently an icy hand fastened itself upon his heart, he did not pause as a man of lesser courage would have done. Without flinching, he watched that shockingly familiar landscape rise around him. 
until he could see the plane from which his journey had started, and the great stairway itself, and at last, Brailden's anxious, waiting face. Again, Grail brought the two ends of the strip together, but now he had given it a half twist so that the band was kinked. Run your finger around it now, he said quietly. Brailden did not need to do so. I understand, he said. You no longer have two separate surfaces. It now forms a single continuous sheet, a one-sided surface, something which at first sight seems impossible. There was a long, brooding silence. Then Grail sighed deeply and turned to Brailden as if he could still see his face. Why did you come back before Chervain? he asked. We had to do it, said Brailden sadly. But I did not wish to see my work destroyed. Grail nodded in sympathy. I understand, he said. Chervain ran his eye up the long flight of steps on which no feet would ever tread again. He felt few regrets. He had striven, and no one could have done more. Such victory as was possible had been his. Slowly, he raised his hand and gave the signal. The wall swallowed the explosion as it had absorbed all other sounds. But the unhurried grace with which the long tears of masonry curtsied and fell was something he would remember all his life. For a moment, he had a sudden, inexpressibly poignant vision of another stairway, watched by another Chervain, falling in identical chaos on the far side of the wall. But that he realized, was a foolish thought, for none knew better than he that the wall possessed no other side. The Wall of Darkness by Arthur C. Clarke Next week on the Lost Sci-Fi Podcast, a zoo is a place where some people make sport of lower animals. That included Kemper, but for him, people were the lower animals. The Man Who Liked Lions by John Bernard Daly. That's next week on the Lost Sci-Fi Podcast with at least one lost vintage sci-fi short story in every episode.